The 12 year old boy in me was thrilled. The 12 year old boy in me is, that's the name of your biographer, I, yes. I believe? Or the name of the movie that you've been shooting? 12 year old boy in me? Wait, I thought you were gonna direct. I might, you know, look, I'm hard up for work. I'll direct that. <laughs> Welcome to Couch Surfing, the show where loquacious guests look back at their big roles, their little roles, and everything in between. I'm here with Kevin Smith. Kevin! Why, hello. Hi! So happy to be here, man. I'm ready to look at my little roles. Let's do it! That's my, uh, that's what all my girlfriends all through high school always yeah, said. Hey, yeah, I like sure. your little role. <laughs> I can handle it. Um, what's the idea here? Should I tell you about what's your going on? Your breakthrough film happened to be your debut. It was. Such an auspicious beginning. Let me tell you something. My breakthrough film being my debut is the only thing I've done. This is the only thing I've been talking about for 25 years. Not like, true. I made clerks. <laughs> hey, man, did you know I made clerks? That's how I introduced my people, myself to people. But I made clerks. Yeah, I made and then clerks. it only changed last year. Like, because I had a heart attack, so finally I had something new to talk about. So now I'm like, I made clerks and I had a heart attack. Isn't that nuts? I can always pivot back to clerks. Doesn't matter what happened. People are like, yoga hoses. I'm like, yeah, but I made clerks once. They're like, he's right. He did do that. So. And I had a heart attack. That's true. And then I throw that on top, too. This is a little sympathy boat. So it was originally given an NC-17 rating. It was. And then you fought to have that brought down to an R rating. Ah, uh, let's, 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 let, let's, yes, let's, let's, let's say I fought. Uh, at the time, Miramax, uh, they didn't have a lot of money uh, back in the day. They were used to doing things uh, on the cheap and trying to make a lot of noise to get attention for their mm -hmm. movies. So they hired Alan Dershowitz. I've heard of him. They had a press conference. He got up and he spoke and he said this. He's going, this movie should be an R. It should not be NC-17 because a teenager should be able to see this movie. I want my teenage son to see this movie so he knows never to do what these two kids do in the movie. <laughs> And then what you do is you go to a, uh, uh, they have this thing, uh, 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 appeals committee, a screening, where if you're given an NC-17, you get to go argue, maybe flip it back to an R without making any cuts. Okay. So I got up and just started saying, like, well, what about this movie and this movie and this movie and this movie? And then next time I went to do it, they're like, you're not allowed to cite precedent. I, I've gone in front of the MPA five times and flipped my rating. Really? Yeah, without making a single cut. It's a record they don't give you a set of steak knives for or anything <laughs> like that, but, like, I'm pretty proud of it. I, I use my that. mouth to get me out of a bad situation. Something tells me that I'm you're an pretty, oralist. You're <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, kids? If you're ever in trouble, the old mouth will get you out of it. You've written a script for Clerks 3, right? I wrote a script for Clerks 3 uh, uh, years it ago. Your King Lear of Films? I, no, I said it was the King Lear of Clerks movies. Oh, um, the there's a very big difference. <laughs> okay. um, but we're not going to make that movie. It's so sad. When I wrote that Wait, movie, why? I was obsessed with death. Okay. Because there's, uh, Clerks is about uh, life in my 20s. And Clerks 2 is Life of My 30s. Clerks 3 was meant to be middle-aged to death. Okay. And then, so I wrote it, and it's obsessed with death, and it's so sad, and it's depressing. You read it, and you're like, this guy forgot that Clerks was a comedy. But, um, but then I had a heart attack, almost died. Right. And so now I know what death is. I don't want to make that movie anymore. Yeah. So we won't make that version of Clerks. Okay. But I have started, just last night, I started writing the new version of Clerks 3 that we're going to do. The new version makes a lot more sense and brings my entire life Full circle. Like those characters, Dante and Randall, I love them to death because they gave me everything. Right. I'm still at the convenience store without those two boys. So I want to return the favor, man, and give them like the life that they gave me. And that's what Clerks 3 is about. Up next. Something that everyone points out onto me on the internet has made my life a living hell since this movie came out on video. Okay. You're about to see the director and the entire crew in one of these fing windows he walks past. Why? Because we were all too young to realize that there were reflections in the real world. <gasps> So look, there we are. There's a whole crew of people following Ben Affleck. And people on the, ever since the internet was born, people have been sending me messages going, do you know that in Chasing Amy, I'm like, yes! Well, speaking of the internet, you know, this film was really groundbreaking at its time. Which one? The, Chasing, Chasing Amy? Amy. Yeah, yes. it was. And, but, you know, if it you look at it through well. a modern lens, then it could be easier to criticize. Yes. But back then, that's very don't That's how, a very sweet way of saying what we now say the buzzword is at this problem. It's <laughs> that movie's problematic because there's some harsh terms in it. Like the Do you find character, it problematic? Uh, yeah, particularly not for me. Okay. I wrote the thing and stuff. But like for some people uh, who didn't come of age in the 90s or whatnot, you know, there's some moments in that movie where Banky, who is meant to be the idiot character, right. you know, is pretty harsh with his language and stuff and could be offensive. Um, it, I think the movie's also offensive on a number of different levels. Like that's a story where the main character is the lamest character in, in the movie. The hero of that movie is Alyssa Jones. It's like, you want it, that's 
who you want to spend your time with, but instead we're worried about what the guy thinks about her life and stuff. But it was the movie that saved my career. Clerks made my career. Mall Rats tanked my career because it did no business. Chasing Amy like put me back on the map. For the longest time, people would be like, that's your best work. But now, since it's problematic, Dogma is the one that everyone talks mm -hmm. to me about in public. <laughs>
So I wrote a version of myself. Uh, I didn't write it because you're not allowed to write it, but I worked with one of the writers up there. And uh, wink. And um, the version of myself is unmarried and has no kid. He's a single director, but he's made Clerks and all those movies. Uh -huh. And then he met Caitlin Ryan, who is a character from Degrassi Junior High, the, who I always loved and stuff. She was a little epileptic girl. Yeah. He wanted to protect her because she was yeah. epileptic and stuff. Great character, and she went through all the series and stuff. And she'd become a journalist in this new version. So I was like, oh, she can interview Kevin Smith. And then we kissed. I broke her and Joey up. It was awesome. I changed the, the, the course, course of Degrassi, of Degrassi history. Degrassi. Yes. These two are heading toward a marriage, and I ruined it. Home wrecker. I know, but that's what you do in a show like that. It's ripped from the headlines. <laughs> remember, that was the show where they gave out bracelets for blood. Remember that episode? I, I don't that? remember that episode, actually. I tried to be on that episode. They wouldn't have me. Uh, <laughs> 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 but you did make the reunion that Drake had. Let me tell you something. You want to see that? that? Let's please, watch that. Please. And then you talk. I will. Thankful for the women that I know. Look at that. Can't go 50 -50 talk about, no you know, a fuel injection of cultural relevance. I mean. This was right after my heart attack, too. So I was like, what a great way to celebrate being alive. Like, I'm, we were in a Drake video. We worked with, uh, I mean, you call him Drake. I call him Aubrey. We worked with Aubrey oh, when me. he was a youngster uh, on Degrassi. And he's Wheelchair honestly, Jimmy. I'm not just saying, like, this because he's famous now. But he was legit, like, the best actor on the show. Really? He he's had star really, quality back then? not star quality. Like, he's a legit great actor. Does Drake call you? Did you call Drake? Not directly. We got a call from somebody. It was it, they couldn't find us through my agency. So like, What's what good are agency? they? Yeah, <laughs> William Morris Endeavor. Thanks. Um, they found us through some other means, and and it was like an email that went to like Jason's side account, like his Twitch account, where they were like, Hey, is this Jay and Silent Bob? Do you you know Drake's looking for you? He wants to be in the video. And you know the email got passed around. We're like, Is he a Nigerian prince who wants two million dollars as well? <laughs> But it was true, it was legitimately Drake. And he asked us to be in the video, and I was like, heavens, yes. So we flew out and, and got was to do really it. Was that really your, was your answer? Heavens, yes. I said, yes, are you kidding me? I said, I need this, I said. Oh my God, we're back, I said. <laughs>Here for. He's oh crazy. my god. Yes. It's live free or die hard. Did you like the Die Hard franchise as much as the Degrassi franchise? Yes. Loved it, absolutely. Yeah. I wish the two would cross over. Like John McClane finds himself in Degrassi on Christmas Eve and the terrorists are there. It writes itself. Um, yeah, this was huge. Uh, not only because I got to be in a Die Hard movie, I got to work with Justin, who I would go on to work with many times. Right. I stuck him in a walrus costume later on. You did. Um, I got to work with Bruce Willis. I was a massive Moonlighting fan throughout my childhood and stuff. Um, so it, it was uh, this was heaven on earth, and he liked me here. Then I made a movie with him called Cop Out. He okay, like so we got to talk about that, because yeah. you famously addressed the fact that you guys had some issues. He didn't like me. He didn't like you. No, I don't. I and honestly you didn't don't love it. him. Yeah, I, yeah. I, my perception at the time was like, ew, he doesn't want to be here. And I've never done the job where somebody didn't want to be there. You know, like making a movie is a, like a privilege and it's exciting. It's like, oh my God, we're getting paid to make pretend like the same shit we would do as children? Oh, I ain't telling right. anybody, this is the greatest scam in the world. He didn't have that really? at all. Yeah, he, he didn't want to be there. And not just like he didn't want to be on my movie. He just didn't seem to like want to be doing it much anymore at all. Have and I was looking for the other guy. Have you guys since... Do you want to hear a story? I yes, was going to touch I your do. leg. I slow forward. No, that's okay. Um, I'll hit your shoulder. Do you okay. want to hear a story? I, I do. Um, <laughs> so I got a phone call. I didn't recognize the number. I was like, this is a telemarketer. Never answered and stuff. Then one day I get a text from that number. It says, Kevin, are you there? It's BW. And I'm sitting there going, BW? Barbara know Walters. Anything. I know. It's like, finally. <laughs> I'm getting my Barbara Walters in. I can't wait to cry about my father. And so uh, I said, BW. He said, B-dub. And I was like... I only know one guy who calls himself B-Dub, and that would be Bruce Willis. And I wrote, Bruce? And he's like, yeah, how are you? And I said, great, man, how are you? I've just been talking shit about you. Yeah, for, for the last 10 years. <laughs> yes. um, but he said, uh, I was waiting for him to be like, I read that book. I'm like, oh, <laughs> So he goes, uh, I got some pictures for you. I said, really? He's going, yeah, I got pictures of you and Rose. And I was like, Rose? He must think my kid's name is Rose, because like my kid was on set and stuff, so maybe that's what he's talking about. Hmm. He's like, I need an address, I wanna send it to you. I said, okay, here's the address, man. It was great talking to you and stuff. Then I got, I was like, you know, I told everyone, I was like, Bruce Willis, like called me out of the blue and sent me pictures, how sweet. I haven't seen the pictures yet, but like they're coming, and how, how nice is that? Then I got a phone call again, 
from that same number. I was like, that's, I know this is Bruce Willis now. And I answered and stuff. I was like, hey, man, what's up? And he's like, hey, how are you? And I was like, I'm good. He's like, did you get those pictures? I was like, uh, they might have got them in Jersey. That's where I'm sent, but I, I didn't see them yet. And he goes, yeah. He's going, um, they were meant for this other Kevin, man. Like, so I sent you. He called the wrong Kevin. <gasps> so he didn't want to call Kevin Smith. He wanted to call some other Kevin who has a rose in his life. Kevin he, James? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. And he called Kevin me instead. Hart? Maybe. I don't know. Somebody got some Kevin out there with a rose. Kevin And Durant? he's got pictures. It could be. Yeah, don't say Spacey. Just... <laughs> You know, that time has passed. But so I was very like, oh, okay, it was a mistake. Good talking to you. And that was that. Up next. <laughs> <laughs> there ain't nothing left oh, but this by is a motion Rimstone. picture. Wait, so this is Every this movie I make should be as good as this movie. Look at that. Michael Get Parks, John Goodman. Look at this exposition. You hear that? There's no score in this movie. There's just a series of sound effects. I put no score in it. That way, anybody who wants to put a score on this movie could literally compose their own score and stuff. You don't need a score when you have a performance this brilliant. Michael Parks, one of the greatest actors ever f***ing lived. Yeah. Um, John Goodman, amazing f***ing actor. One of the greatest, my favorite actors that ever f***ing lived. So this was the movie to prove to people, like, if I wanted to be a good filmmaker, I could have been. I was just more interested in, like, telling Kevin Smith stories. This is me doing Quentin by way of the Coen brothers. <laughs>
God, I wasn't prepared. So I told the doctor, I was like, you got to save me. He goes, why? I was like, I got to make Jay and Silent Bob reboot. And he goes, yeah, that's a good reason to live. So I was hell-bent to make the movie. So it went from being like this one-joke movie to a memorial, a scrapbook, a testimony, a eulogy, a living eulogy and shit. I look at the movie and I love it because I'm like, it works like a gravestone. Anybody looks at this movie will go, oh, Kevin Smith, born here, died here, and in between, that's the weird shit he f***ing did. I felt like, all right, this is it. This is the reason to make the movie, man. But now, the problem is, if I don't now f***ing die right away, mm -hmm. I gotta keep working. That means everything I do has to stand for the last f***ing thing I do. I'm working on this He-Man well, show for Netflix, Masters Universe. What? You won't believe how epic this shit's become because I was like, this has to be the final testimony of my life. And they're like, it's about Skeletor, bro. <laughs> Skeletor skeleton fighting he man. I'm like, no, no, no. This is about the struggles I went through as an artist, you know. Now that you've done my show, it yes. can all end. You're fine. I'd like to tell you, <laughs> I did not do your show. Your show did the f out of me. I'm gonna walk out of here crooked. Like with a big ow. Uh, you know, your show did me, my friend. <laughs> it hurt in a good way. <laughs> Take us out. Take us out. Take us out before there's more clips. To go. You gotta take us home. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be on the couch all night. Let me do it. All right. Jay and Silent Bob reboot, ladies and gentlemen, is gonna be in theaters October 15th and 17th. You're like, what? Yes, two days. Uh, any multiplex near you. For tickets, go to fathomevents.com, uh, man, slash reboot. reboot. Now, that's if you wanna see it uh, on the 15th or 17th. If not, you can see it. Uh, with me and Jay on the Jay and Silent Bob Reboot Roadshow Tour. And that's going clear till March. We're going to 62 cities. Like a rock band, but with no band, just two old men. And you and bring a movie. your weed, that's your own special it. strain. Can I, can I pick my weed? <laughs> Dude, where did I do with it? No, what did you joint? do with it? I took it out of my pocket before we went. Well, you God. find your weed. Is it there? Thank you. That's my wallet. See you next week on Couch Surfing. Where's my weed? <laughs>